Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. We will discuss the scope of the current shortage of workers in the U.S. and review some popular options for attracting and retaining talent. In a climate like this, we often see more creative bells and whistles approaches to employee compensation and benefits, but they come with a host of labor and employment law challenges. Today, we will explore those challenges and discuss how HR professionals, in-house legal counsel, and business owners can implement solutions to help attract and retain talent while mitigating risk. Now, we have a lot to cover today, but don't worry if you missed something from our presentation. In a day or two, we'll be sending you the links and the slides to the recording today. And in a couple of minutes, I'll share how you can see a demo of any of the compliance HR solutions that are of interest. Also, we are happy to answer any questions you may have. If you submit questions via the Q&A box, we'll try to answer them during our session today. First, let me introduce myself. My name is Kimball Norup, and I want to say thank you for taking time out of your today to join us on this webinar. There are several thousand people on the call today, so I know it's a hot topic. As the CEO of Compliance HR, I lead our team of compliance experts and developers and manage our day-to-day -day operations. One of the highlights of my role is participating in thought leadership events like this, along with our Littler colleagues. If you're not familiar with Compliance HR, we're a joint venture between two innovative organizations, the AI tech company, Neota, and Littler Mendelssohn, the world's largest employment law firm. Compliance HR offers a variety of solutions designed with expert content from Littler to assist you in complying with important HR topics like employee handbook policies, wage and hour, paid leave, worker classification, and other labor law requirements. Our objective is to help simplify the complexity of employment law for human resources professionals and the attorneys that support them. I'd like to quickly highlight three of our solutions that I think have particular relevance to our webinar topic today. First is Policy Smart, which is a constantly updated federal and 50 state reference to help employers build and maintain a compliant employee handbook. Next is Navigator Independent Contractor, which helps employers to make an informed worker classification determination. And finally, Navigator Onboarding which helps employers prepare compliant onboarding documents like offer letters, employment applications, and NDAs. Now in a second here, you'll see a survey pop up. If you're interested in learning more, a survey should show up on your screen. Simply answer yes, and your contact information will go to one of our experts, and they'll set up a conversation with you about your compliance strategy and how Compliance HR might be able to help support it. If you like what you see in the demo, you're always, we are always happy to offer a free trial of our products so that you can see precisely how much time and money they can save you. If you're not sure at this time, you'll have another chance before we conclude our presentation today, or you can always request more information via the link on this interface or in the Q&A box, or even just going to our website at compliancehr.com. Now, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing today's presenter, Bruce Sarche. Bruce is a Littler shareholder based out of their Sacramento, California office. He focuses on representation of management in labor and employment law matters, which is what makes him perfect for today's topic. If you have not heard Bruce present before, you're in for a real treat. He is not only an employment law expert, he's also a very engaging speaker. Bruce, with that introduction, I'm now going to pass the baton over to you. All right, Kimball, thank you very much. Hello, my friends. Thanks for joining us here today. We're going to talk about the labor shortage in the United States. It's, it's bad out there. People are still struggling to find qualified workers to fill positions, even in the wake of the recent downsizing across several different industries in our economy. We're seeing more and more reductions in force, but yet still difficult to find workers 
to fill those positions. So let's take a look at the civilian labor force participation rate. And you say, what is that? Well, it's the number of people age 16 and older who are employed or actively seeking employment divided by the total non-institutionalized civilian working age population. So if you've got all that, you can see what's going on here. The little gray stripes are official recessions. The first one, of course, when the housing bubble popped and those five guys made that money in the big short movie. And then the next one, of course, is our pandemic, which we're still sort of living through. And you can see where we are today compared to where we were 20 years ago. The number of people age 16 and older who are employed or actively seeking employment compared to the general population who's not in jail is really down. It's just, you can't argue with these numbers. Sure, it's bounced back since the early days of the pandemic, but it's still down. And the U.S. Chamber of Commerce sort of flips that graph on its head and says, there's like 3 million workers that are missing that used to be in the workforce. And this is only from 2020 to 2023. What does this mean for us just in general? Well, we don't have enough workers pumping oil out of the ground. So what happens? The price of oil goes up. We've all seen this as well. It's come back down quite a bit recently, but still it's up. And so with that, let's take a quick survey here and ask you to answer a simple question. And this isn't the most scientific survey because we have no idea how many workers you actually have. But if you could just answer and say, how many vacancies do you have today? You're looking for workers. The numbers are coming in here. And uh, let's take a look. We've got about, thank you for participating. Everybody's uh, clicking their answers. It's starting to slow down. And the winner is 11 to 100 vacancies amongst the audience, uh, about 40%. Uh, if we could fit, close out the poll now and maybe share the results, that might be nice for people to see. But the labor shortage, as you can see from our little benchmarking here, is a very real situation. People are grappling with it. And there's a number of innovative and creative ways that people are responding to it. Uh, for example, you can go on the internet and Google this, companies that hire felons. If you're a felon and you want to find a job, there's an internet resource out there that can help you. Why is this happening? Why do we have this tremendous drop off in the civilian workforce that's employed or actively seeking employment. Well, there's a number of different theories that have been batted around. Here's one. Uh, there's a structural labor shortage due to retirement, deaths, and not enough immigration. Very early on, I was looking at the early Q&As here, and some astute viewer in, uh, typed in the question, are there any immigration solutions on the horizon? <laughs> Great question. You gotta, you gotta wonder. And I don't, I personally don't know of any great immigration solutions on the horizon. And what this means is that workers are going to hold the upper hand for many years. It's a, it's a. Let's see. What is it? Buyer's market, seller's market, seller. And the seller is the employee. And you, my friends, on this webinar, you are the buyer. So we've seen wages trending up as well. They've been holding steady at about three percent. They've jumped to five. Uh, it is a real high turnover. And another reason perhaps is during the pandemic, a lot of people went out and formed and created their own businesses. Another possible theory is we do have a lot of people incarcerated and that can be a drag on employment. And let's not forget about this, that COVID is still out there. You might want to forget about COVID but it hasn't forgotten about you. And some people just don't really want to go back to work. So how are employers responding to the chronic and structural labor shortage in the United States? Well, we've seen advertisements everywhere. We've seen, hey, you want to go get a hamburger? Sure, go get a hamburger. Hey, how about an interview? I mean, I called up to order a pizza delivered the other night, and the person on the other end took my order. Very nice 
uh, fellow, and he said, hey, uh, by the way, we're looking to hire people. Do you want to come to work here? And I said, it sounds very intriguing, but no thanks. Tonight, I'll just have a pizza. Hiring bonuses, new fringe benefits, all kinds of incentive compensation out there. You name it, we're trying it. So with that introduction, let's shift now to the content. We're going to talk about ideas, and we're going to talk about the legal pitfalls, and we're going to talk about how you can avoid those legal pitfalls. We've got a lot of information to cover. I'm a lawyer. This webinar does not substitute for advice of counsel. You're going to see a little, little bit more words on my slides than if you've, if you've seen me present before. That's okay. We're not going to read every word to you, but you will have them later on as a resource. So let's start at the beginning. You have a vacancy. Before you go out and say, hey, let's just get an employee to fill that, stop. Ask yourself, do we really need to hire a new person? Maybe we can restructure the business and re sort of think how we get this done. Do we really need, because we had a maintenance worker three here before, do we really need another maintenance worker three? Maybe we can restructure. Maybe we can move someone from one end of the organization to the other. How about using a temporary agency? That is a booming business right now. My friends, if you're a if you happen to own a healthcare nurse registry, you're doing pretty good. They are really going great guns. What about using an independent contractor? Okay, beware. California, for example, is at war with independent contractors. We hate them. Hate, hate, hate them. The legislature hates them. Supreme Court hates them. Governor doesn't really like them either. And this is sort of translated to other states as well. So the use of a contractor to do what an employee used to do for you could be a very high risk proposition in many states of the United States. And maybe you're in the situation where you had had people laid off before and you will have the opportunity to recall them. And this is a new thing. It's been part of union contracts for decades in the United States that if you have a layoff, it's in reverse order of seniority. And when you recall, you recall in order of seniority. Well, that concept has been now devolved to the state and city governments. And we see a number of cities and states with right to recall laws. This is a new trend born out of the pandemic. If you're in typically the hospitality industry, then you've got this seniority-based recall procedure uh, and some of these statutes contain something interesting. If you get notice, hey, I don't think I was recalled and I should have been, then the employer has the right to cure and to fix that going forward. So that's number one, before you recruit, think about, do we really need to replace that worker with another worker or is there something else we can do? Every time you have a termination of an employee, every time you have a retirement or a resignation, it's an opportunity to rethink the way you're doing things. And don't, I, I would submit to you, if you're if you're taking this seriously, you don't just knee jerk and say, all right, let's get somebody else to fill. And sometimes that's the right approach. But stop, think a little bit and see whether or not you can't do something different. So recruiting everywhere with the uh, pandemic driving many employees to do work from home, even non-exempt employees, punching, staying home but punching a time clock, that's quite a concept and would have been a foreign concept to most businesses in the United States four years ago. But now it's just part of the way we do things. So heck, you're in Nevada, why not recruit people to do the work in Texas if they're just going to stay home anywhere? Uh, there's a, there's a, some trend though that's happening in the United States and it started in Colorado with a pay transparency law. And there was this sort of window of time during the pandemic when businesses were recruiting everywhere, but not Colorado, because they had this pay transparency law. And what's happened, these ideas used to start in California and then spread across the United States. This one maybe started in Colorado and we have a number of pay transparency laws. So the ability to sort of get around that is not, uh, not gonna be present for much longer. If you're going to advertise in a particular state, you need to be transparent and disclose what the job pays. 
Here's some information on California's law. As I said, more words on this slide than we have time to pay attention to, but there's a requirement when you post the job to post the pay. There's a pay data re uh, requirement and a records retention requirement as well and still more information. And this is just sort of an by example. As the, you saw on the map of the United States earlier, there are many other states and cities with these same sorts of pay transparency laws, keeping records. So more and more compliance obligations if you want to use employees to, do a, to run a business here in the Golden State. Also, it's more than just pay transparency if you're looking to recruit everywhere, recruit from distant from where your office and your headquarters is. Different states have different laws. What about employment verification? What about checking criminal history, arrest records? What about fair credit and uh, credit disclosures when you're doing those sorts of things, uh, credit checks? And different states have different laws about accessing social media and the right of privacy of individuals. And so if you're recruiting outside of your sort of comfort zone, your home base. There are a host of legal in labor and employment law challenges which you're going to face. It's just part of uh, working outside of your backyard. Applicate more, <laughs> there's more here. I have another slide on all these uh, requirements. Uh, and salary history inquiries are not allowed in some states. What'd you make at your prior job? It's not allowed in some states, but it is allowed in others. We also have help from our friends at Compliance HR who are sponsoring this webinar. And so when we're onboarding somebody and we're looking at recruiting everywhere, Kimball, maybe just a few words about what the Navigator onboarding suite can do uh, with if someone signs up with Compliance HR. Of course. Yeah, sure thing, Bruce. So as you mentioned, there's a number of federal and state specific requirements uh, to be mindful of when you're going through a hiring process. Um, you know, I, uh, the previous slides really covered them in depth, but the, the gotcha there is there are a lot of jurisdiction specific variances between what might be a federal law and state, state applications. Uh, the Navig Navigator onboarding suite really helps with three primary things. It, it helps uh, HR professionals and, and in-house counsel or anyone else preparing these documents to create a, a compliant offer letter, as well as an employment application, uh, you know, basically the questions you should ask outside of a resume, and finally an NDA document. And based on the inputs to a, a few simple questions, uh, the, the application then spits out a, a Word doc or a PDF version of the document that can then be edited further or used. Um, we find this to be a, a real efficiency booster for teams uh, to produce these documents and to have the reassurance that the, the subject matter expertise of Littler is behind the content that's coming out of them. So very, very popular application for us. And of course, uh, if you're interested in seeing it, feel free to sign up for a demo. We're happy to happy to show off what we built. And back okay, to you. Okay, good deal. Thanks, Kimball. Um, so I've got a question here. It's a good one. Can we pay a different wage rate if we're hiring in a different geographical area? The general answer is yes, but pay attention when we get to segment six, which is all about pay equity, because when we move outside of our home state, we do have to consider what are we going to pay these people? So we'll cover that in more detail in segment six, but it's a great question. All right, let's move on to segment three, artificial intelligence hiring tools. Maybe this can help us with the chronic labor shortage. We can use AI and that'll help us get good candidates, great candidates, et cetera, et cetera. This is a real thing, my friends, the use of artificial intelligence in making what traditionally were personnel decisions, and especially in the recruiting area. There's a number of big businesses that have a lot of big data that they can look at. They can look at 10,000 people, let's say, doing a particular job. What did their job application look like? What was their experience? Now we compare that to success on the job 5, 10, 15 years later. What was it that we saw in the application that led to success? What's the correlation there? And that's just one example of how big data could be used in a personnel 
environment and human resources environment and there's many many more the use of these tools is on the rise they've got if you just go on the internet goof around for a little bit and see what's out there there are all sorts of tools available they promise a number of things to source candidates to screen candidates to interview <laughs> candidates yes you can you can be interviewed by a computer and to help you pick those candidates as well what about this should we do this well let's just back up a little bit here because this is sort of uh, unexplored water even though it is it, you know it's here it's real but still people are being cautious about it and i i think rightly so who's going to make the decisions why are we doing this does that tool really align with our goals and what are the metrics that are going to be used what is that big data that's going to be used to drive the ultimate decisions that are made. So artificial intelligence and in recruiting is here. It's something to be thinking about. Is it a panacea? Is it a magic bullet to help with the labor shortage? No, I don't, I don't think so, but something worthy of consideration. Let's move on to segment number four, and we're going to talk about privacy and online recruiting. Everybody pretty much is recruiting online. Now, there are state variations in the, our workplace privacy laws. What can you ask? How long do you need to ret retain it? If you're even going to go global, then of course we've got global considerations as well. And if you're using some sort of electronic tracking system, that could possibly trip you up as well because now you've got information that you're storing. And as we know, there is always the chance of a data security breach and not a friendly thing for anyone to have to live through. Um, is this volume really what we want to be uh, undertaking? <laughs> You know, more is more better. Well, maybe not. Maybe you just got too much, uh, too many applicants. Of course, you're probably out there going, "Bros, you're just crazy." <laughs> too many applicants. That doesn't exist today, but I guess maybe it's a possibility. Or sort of missing the qualified applicant, and and, and you've you know you've not able to identify the correct uh, individual or the correct individuals. And then here's a big one, verifying the authenticity of their online profile. I don't know if this has been studied or not, but I have a, I kind of believe, you know, there's such a thing as resume puffery, building up your resume. It's, it's been in the news quite a bit recently with regard to one particular uh, member of the legislative branch of our federal government. I think it happens online as well. People are not always 100% taking the Boy Scout pledge when they describe themselves in their online posting. So let's think about this as well. Maybe the way to get more people to apply for your vacant positions is not be so rigorous in your background checks. Just make it a little easier to pass through that filter. Remember, I had an, a slide early on uh, about companies that hire felons. Okay, companies that hire felons have scrolled or scaled back the background check requirement. But of course, anytime we're talking about hiring felons, you have to think about, well, what happens if something bad happens? And there's a, a real law in the United States and in many states called negligent hiring. You didn't meet the general common law standard of negligence. You didn't act like a reasonably prudent person would in similar circumstances. And those can be bad for an organization. Um, and, you know, there's all sorts of risks that go along with this. I do think, though, that people have scaled back the background check, and it brings to mind a conversation that I was having with uh, a client in far northern California. I'm in Sacramento, and when I say to these people from Crescent City and Ukiah and Eureka that I'm in northern California, they say, no, no, Bruce, you're not in northern California. 
we're in Northern California. You're in more in Central California. I say, okay, f fair, fair enough point. But this person told me, and this was about 10 years ago, you know what? We have a rule about marijuana use up here. And the rule is don't do it at work. <laughs> we don't care what you do at home. Just don't bring it to work. Don't do it at work. But we're not going to drug test for people for the presence of marijuana, because if we did that, we would not be able to staff. We would not have a workforce. What we've seen is this trend has crept south in California and crept east across the United States. I think we've lived through a real scaling back of that particular aspect. When I first started doing this, people were testing for the use of marijuana. If you use marijuana and it was in your system, a marijuana test means you've used it within the last 30 days, excuse me, a positive test, uh, you wouldn't get the job. Not so much today. So I think a number of businesses, a number of organizations are so, uh, quote unquote, scaling back the background check. Now, let's think about Googling the applicant. What a nice shortcut. You just go online and you look at their profile and you get some real good information uh, about them. Some risks here. A number of states protect what's known as lawful off-duty conduct. So these actually started, uh, interestingly enough, as uh, cigarette smoker laws. <laughs> you are the right to smoke cigarettes when you want to off-duty and uh, it's, it's not against the law and it can't be used uh, against you. And it's been broadened out in a number of states to cover anything, pretty much. So if you look online and you find that somebody's doing something in particular, let's just say cigarette smoking, and you say, I'm not going to give you that job. Well, that could be discrimination uh, in violation of one of these state laws. Also, the second bullet here is probably uh, even more important. There's a reason why we don't ask what someone's age is on a job application. There's a reason why we don't ask what year they graduated from high school. There's a reason why we don't ask what's your maiden name on a job application because then we have information. And if we don't give the job to the applicant, they say, aha, you didn't give me this job because of my age or you didn't give me this job because of my national origin that was disclosed through me giving you my maiden name. And if you've asked that question, it's, you can't say you didn't know. If you don't ask the question, you can say, I didn't know. Now bring that into 2023 and you're on the internet and you're Googling away and you're looking for someone's background and you find out, oh, you've got their national origin. Oh, you find out their age. They don't get the job you're not going to be able to say, I didn't know. The third bullet here is also real important, inconsistency across the organization. This is how a lot of employment discrimination cases are lost because in department number one, we terminated the person for doing X, but in department number two, we only gave them a final written warning and the person who's terminated said, why did I get terminated and that person over there only get a final written warning, well, it's honestly because of my age or my pregnancy or my religion or whatever my protected category is. So the same thing translates here to looking online for information about job applicants. And then there's this problem of implicit bias. I hope you've all given some thought to this within your organization. I hope you have thought about implicit bias training for your organization. People have biases. And they can come out it's like, yeah, you see this information online and yeah, you're just going to move away from them because they're not looking like you. They're not acting like you. They have a last name that doesn't really sound like your last name. So beware of those implicit biases. We have a number of uh, businesses we work with that just say we don't do it. it, it we're going to use more traditional approaches. I have a feeling that some businesses tell me, Bruce, we're not going to do it, but then they do it. And they're doing it anyways. But I mean, as long as, you know, as long as they understand the risks, then okay. I think a lot of companies do this. And if you're doing it, then think about how you institutionalize this. 
uh, are we going to have rules and guardrails in place to maintain that uh, that sort of consistency across the organization? Are we going to have particular categories of people that uh, we're going to designate as able to do this? Are we just going to outsource it completely? Um, there's online resources that are public, that are easily checked, registered sex offenders, specially designated nationals. That has to do, that was developed in the wake of the 9 11 uh, tragedy uh, to deal with uh, terrorists coming to U.S. soil. So maybe those are some options to consider. But if you do decide, eh, we're just going to do it, Bruce. Thanks for all those uh, alarm bells. But make sure you're consistent. Identical searches for everybody. Everybody gets searched. Do you want to keep records of this? Probably so you're able to prove what, you, what, you, what you've done. Screen the unlawful information from the decision maker. So maybe you've got a two-step process in there. How do you check authenticity? How do you check reliability? And if you find something, don't just decide. Say, hey, I see this is what you've been doing. Could you, would you like to explain your position on that and maintain those records? So the online uh, search of applicants is real. It's out there. But we need to be careful and and thoughtful about it. If you're going to do one thing with regard to this topic, I would say it's got to be the consistency. Do something to maintain a consistent approach. What about hiring people with a criminal record? And you know what? I should have put a slide in here. Now I'm thinking I was at a uh, workshop the other day and where there was someone from our um, state unemployment agency here in California the Employment Development Department, they've got to hire a veterans program. And you can get a tax break if you hire a, a veteran. And I think it's a state tax break and maybe federal as well. So that might be a place to think about calling up your local uh, unemployment agency and see if they have a similar program. And I thought of that because I see the reference to tax credit here. Also, hiring people with a criminal record can... Um, uh, provide for the tax credit as well. Perhaps they realize, hey, I've got a good thing here. It's not easy for me to get a job, so I'm going to stick around even though, uh, you know, so you've got that sort of potential for more retention. Here's something I've been talking about for a number of years as well, and that is that if someone has a criminal record, well, let's take a look at what it is that they did and when did they do it? Uh, asking, not asking for a show of hands, but think back to when you were in high school. Uh, did you always do everything the smartest way you possibly could have and nice, responsible, exercising good judgment? Probably not. Probably not. And um, I'm guilty of that as well. But that was many years ago for me and maybe uh, more than just a few years ago for you and maybe so for the job applicant that you're looking at as well. So consider the temporal proximity, as we lawyers like to say, of the misconduct to the current day and, and how serious was it. I mean, people do make mistakes and we're trying to get jobs filled. We're trying to get workers. So the possibility is there of hiring employees with a criminal record. All right, let's get on to now some of the approaches that are being taken by businesses to deal with the chronic labor shortage, the structural labor shortage. And that brings us to incentive compensation. Um, let's see, though. We've got a number of questions, and maybe before we shift... Uh, yeah, here's a good question. Before we shift away from sort of the bringing people on board to the compensation and benefits and making making an attractive place to work, let me take a look at a couple of questions. This one's pretty good. If someone doesn't get the job due to the potential employer Googling their info and finding out, for example, their national origin, how would the candidate come to find out that the employer Googled them? Just want to know how this kind of info might reach the potential applicant. Well, that's a good question. And I've done enough employment litigation over the years to know that if you get into a lawsuit, everything is probably going to come out eventually. 
some cases actually settle early because we know there's information. It would just be better if we settled this and everybody moved on with their life. But if someone is of a particular national origin and they get the sense that they didn't get the job because of that and somebody else of a different national origin did get the job and they file a discrimination complaint, people from HR eventually could be asked questions. People from operations could be asked questions, including these. And that's how perhaps uh, you're, um, uh, you get that information. This is another good question. Is asking the year of college graduation, college graduation, discriminatory? Uh, I don't think per se, but I wouldn't do it because it's now 2023. Let's think about the possible answers to that question. You ask it of 10 applicants and one says, well, I graduated college in 20." 22. The other says, I graduated college in 1978. And then the other 10 are somewhere in between that. Now you have real information about an age range of potential applicants from age 22 to age 62. I don't think you should ask that. I, I don't think, um, I don't like, I don't like it. <laughs> I don't know per se illegal, like high school graduation is like, no, just definitely don't ask that. Don't ask mother's maiden name. I wouldn't ask college uh, graduation either. Now, the flip side of that is there may be particular situations where current knowledge of particular um, technical things is important. There may be a way to ask that without asking year of college graduation. For example, are you skilled in XYZ123 method of doing ABC? Well, maybe that's only been taught in colleges in the last four years or five years, but it's important for this job. And somebody who graduated college 30 years ago still could have learned this. So that's a way to focus on the actual skills needed for the job without um, stepping on an employment discrimination potential landmine. All right, those are some good questions. Uh, let's get back to the slides here, the prepared materials, and talk a little bit about incentive compensation. It's been said, what's the best way to solve a problem? Well, money. Throw money at the problem. And as I mentioned earlier, we've seen an uptick in compensation for employees over the last five to six years. You see it trending along there, the blue line, excuse me, the red dotted line, nibbling at 3%, and then in the middle of the pandemic, starting to climb up. And more recently, we've seen increases in the 5% range. A, a fair amount of my work is negotiating contracts with labor unions. And we've just seen this, the amount of pay raises that are being negotiated in those contracts is up. It's historically, it was at 3% for quite a while. And I've seen it uptick into the fours, four and a half and fives recently. And the same thing is happening at workforces where employees are not represented by union unions. The best way to solve a problem is to throw money at it. And we've seen that happening in the civilian workforce as well. So what incentive compensation ideas have you got? I would invite you to put in the question and answer section right now. It's not a question that you're going to ask. It's just going to say, at my company, we are doing this. Whatever it is that you're doing to get incentive compensation out there. And uh, maybe, um, Kimball, you can take a look at those and see if there's any innovative and interesting ideas that we can uh, bring up and share with the audience at the end of our segment five here. So if you've got an incentive comp idea that you like, let us know about it. Here's a very popular one, referral incentive. Get somebody to come to work here and we'll give you X thousand dollars. And we've seen pretty significant referral bonuses to current employees. At my law firm, Littler Mendelssohn, we have one if you're an associate attorney and you refer another 
person to come and work here as an associate attorney and they stay for a year and they have successful performance, then uh, you get a nice little bonus. Uh, I'm a shareholder at the firm. I don't qualify because I own the firm. I'm supposed to be doing this anyways, but it has led to a lot of success. I'm in our Sacramento office and just down the hall, there's two lawyers working right now and there's a Further down the hall is Nick McKinney, and he referred those two lawyers to us, and we're hoping that they stick around for a year, of course. Uh, the echo chamber could be a problem here. In other words, we're referring people who look like us, who think like us, et cetera, who went to the same schools, et cetera. So beware of that as a possible downside in these referral bonus programs. What about for job applicants? Uh, show up to work and we'll give you money on the first day before you even do anything. We have seen these. They used to be, you know, maybe at the higher levels of the organization. We've seen them moving their way down and they are available for just regular line worker positions. Average positions, but those that are in high demand, even for non-exempt employees, is a real popular way. It's a sign-on bonus. But then the question comes up. You pay them a sign-on bonus. Let's just say it's a nurse, and you pay this nurse $5,000 as a sign-on bonus. They say, great. They take the $5,000, they work for one week, and they quit. And you've just paid them 5000 extra dollars for a week of work. Could this happen? Uh, yeah, it, it could happen. So businesses often say, we want a little protection. We want to be able to get our money back. Can you get your money back? Well, not automatically, not necessarily. Uh, you can try to structure contractual agreements to get money back if people leave earlier. These can be a little bit messy and a little bit complicated. Uh, there are laws about deducting from people's paychecks. Another possible idea is to pay it out over time and uh, make it on a quarterly basis. If you stick with us, you're a nurse. You're a nurse. You're getting hired. We'll pay you one thousand two hundred fifty dollars today, and we'll pay you another one thousand two hundred and fifty dollars at the end of three months of work, and another and another up to a total of five thousand dollars. That way, if the nurse leaves early, you can you don't get your money back, but you've never paid it. And then watch out for the people who are making promises out there on your behalf. If you employ salesmen and the salesmen are out there recruiting for people, be careful because salesmen, salespersons, I should say, they sell. That's what they do. And they might overpromise, and then you're going to be in a little bit of trouble. And, and I'm, not, I'm, I'm picking on them and being a little bit sarcastic, which isn't the nicest thing to do. So I apologize to all the people out there that our salespeople are related to or in love with salespeople. But it's a, it's a lesson for us all. Don't overpromise. Be careful when you're making these representations about your bonus payments. Uh, incentives to continue work. We saw hazard pay in, during the pandemic quite a bit. People saying, this is thank you for coming to work because people like Bruce, the lawyer, are staying home and not going out, but you still have to come to work, so we'll give you some extra pay for that. Shift differentials. In healthcare in particular, the thing that I've seen recently is weekend differentials. There's been, I've been practicing law for a number of years in employment law the whole time, and uh, we've always seen swing shift and night shift differentials. But now, particularly in healthcare, if you're not paying a weekend differential, your competitors probably are. And maybe it's time to evaluate that as well. Attendance bonuses. And uh, when you get into these bonuses, we need to think about this legal concept. And it's not a fun legal concept. It's the regular rate of pay. If you've got non-exempt employees 
and you pay them, let's just say you're paying them $20 an hour, what's their overtime rate? Well, it's time and a half, $30 an hour. But if at the end of the quarter, you get a bonus of $1,000, the government says, wait a second, we don't want this to be a subterfuge for avoiding the payment of overtime. So you need to take that $1,000 and put it back into the hourly rate of pay. So the real hourly rate of pay wasn't $20 an hour. It was $20.50 or $20.83, whatever the math works out to be. So their overtime rate shouldn't have been $30. It should have been $32 or whatever the math works out to be. So when you pay them the $1,000 bonus, you need to also true up their overtime and give them another little check for $642, whatever the math works out to be there as well. So be aware. And now in California, for example, it's very strict. If it's based on a formula and it's flat sum, you've got to recalculate the regular rate of pay and true up the bonus. California, we also have this provision about a one hour of pay for a missed meal or a missed rest break, or a missed heat recovery break, or a missed lactation break. When you go back and true up overtime, if in that quarter they had four missed meal premiums and you paid them an hour of pay for those, well, now you have to true that up as well because their regular rate of pay wasn't $20. It was $20.67. So keep that in mind. If you're paying these incentive compensations uh, if you've got an incentive compensation plan, beware the regular rate of pay. How do you get around this? Well, there's a couple of ways maybe that you can get around it. Uh, you could say, we're just going to increase your salary going forward. Good job. You get an extra 1%. I've seen uh, 2%, 3%, whatever it is. I've seen programs where they try to take that back. It's like, well, you didn't meet your you met it in quarter one, so we're going to give you 3% raise for quarter two. But you didn't meet it in quarter two, so we're going to cut your pay by 3% in quarter three. Uh, it's not going to work so good. People get used to that 3%, so beware. Other non-monetary incentives, we've seen a lot of creative things. I was speaking to a local human resources group here in California Central Valley. This was maybe two months ago, and the topic of the labor shortage was uh, being discussed. And someone said, you know what we're doing? We're giving eggs. <laughs> I said, eggs? He said, yeah, because this was two months ago. You may remember seeing it on the news. The price of eggs like tripled, at least in California, overnight. Was, Why are eggs so expensive? So what they were doing was at the end of the week, at the end of the shift, they went out and they bought a bunch of eggs. And they said, we know inflation's hitting you hard. It's a difficult time for you to make ends meet with your family. So here's a dozen <laughs> eggs for everybody, a nice little incentive compensation. Um, all sorts of uh, other incentives possible out there. Let people bring their pets to work. Beware, I have read a recent case where someone brought the, a cat to work and um, this was against company policy. Well, the cat had some fleas on it. The fleas jumped off and got on a coworker who got bites. We had to send her home and the workers comp was involved and on and on and on. So all of these various creative non-monetary incentives. You want to try to have a terrific place to work. That's what keep people will keep people coming in. You want to have really good motivated, energized supervisors because that will keep people coming into work. How do you solve a problem? Throw money at it? Uh, maybe that's part of it, but um, let's think about having a great workplace as well. Another incentive is remote work. This people seem to like. There are a number of questions that telecommuters ask, and a lot of these uh, deal with sort of your non-exempt employees, and then some of them deal with your exempt employees as well. And number five, a lot of people like it. I personally didn't like it that much. I find I'm more productive when I come into the office, but that's easy for me to say because I have a relatively short commute. So it doesn't change really my ability to work a number of hours during the day. But people do like this whole remote work thing. But then we get into the question of expense reimbursement. And here we've got an average remote worker. You can see he's adopted the business casual approach here. What do we see in the photo that might be subject to expense reimbursement from his employers? Well, let's put a, a red arrow 
on the screen for everything that could be subject to reimbursement. And oh, geez, that's a lot of red arrows. We got the pencils, we got the printer, we got the whiteboard, we got electricity, we got the box surrounding the whole thing, we've got rent. What? We have to pay people's rent if they work at home? Well, maybe. Here's a social media advertisement found in California inviting people to sign up for a wage and hour class action to get reimbursement for utilities and rent. My friends, this is a very state specific question and there's all kinds of standards that apply across the 50 states. And there's a simple map that will help you understand all this. We could actually have like another two hour webinar, maybe three, just on going through how do you calculate expense reimbursement. Now we could do that if you wanted to. Or you could hit yourself in the head with a hammer. And a lot of people would say, hmm, I got to listen to three hours on expense reimbursement across the states or hit myself in the hammer. They might take a little bit of time to think about which of the two of those choices they're going to take. But here's my advice. Don't take up the hammer. Find out one state at a time what the obligations are. Learn and apply those local requirements. It is complicated, but people do have a right to be reimbursed for their business expenses. That brings us to segment number six. Oh, wait a second. Let's see. What did we get some responses? Market adjustment, matching biggest competitors' offerings. PTO, yeah, come to work here and we'll give you more time off. I mean, it is an incentive. Uh, rehire bonuses for employees that return to the company. Ah, boomerang bonus, I like that. Daily pay program, that's interesting. I think it is a more and more of a coming thing. There are legal pitfalls to daily pay as well. And as we see this broadening out, I'm afraid we're also gonna see more employment litigation. Well, thank you for participating in that informal survey. Some great ideas there. Hey, Bruce, equity. Bruce, real quick, uh, real quick, yeah. Bruce, there, there was another interesting one that caught my eye. Um, a, lot, a number of responses around offering a travel bonus or an incentive, which I wonder, Ooh. just I, I wonder out loud if that might lead to the remote worker discussion of, you know, you have employees that are working in States you might not even know of, and that, that opens up all kinds of exposure. Oh, yeah. Well, the whole question of what law applies and whether you're actually qualified to do business in a remote state is another challenge of the remote worker. Uh, we've had people leave and not tell the company that they're right. now working from <laughs> Colorado. It's like, well, we're not set up to do business in that state. And what do you do with that? We don't know how to do payroll taxes there, on and on and on and on. So a number of challenges. Remote work is a big incentive, but it comes with a number of risks as well. Pay equity. Let's walk through a simple example here. This is a hypothetical nursing home. It's uh, owned by me, and uh, we have a Los Angeles and a Sacramento facility. It's called the Bruce Sarche Nursing Home Company. And uh, here's the org chart at each. I, I don't know about this shortened name. I think I might need to get another PR or marketing consultant to work on, on that that name. But at, for example, at LA, we've got a nursing department, dietary maintenance, housekeeping, and activities. So what does our equal pay laws say? Well, let's look at California as sort of a case study. And this applies to a lot of different states as well. The old law was you have to pay people at the same establishment the same pay if they're doing equal work. So establishment would mean LA. Establishment would mean Sacramento. So you don't have to look at the two together. Equal work would mean maintenance is different from dietary. They do different things. But our law changed in 2016, and now you have to pay at the same employer for substantially similar work. So that means we can compare Los Angeles and Sacramento. That means we can compare dietary and maintenance if they really are substantially similar. Maintenance is different from dietary because they do different things. But if this director of those departments supervises five employees, has to maintain a budget, does performance evaluations, et cetera, et cetera, and that's the same across both jobs, then they're probably substantially similar, even though pre-2016, they would not have been equal. You can pay different or different. You don't have to pay everybody exactly the same. If the jobs are different, if the geography is different, that was our earlier question that I alluded to, 
these are bona fide factors other than sex or national origin that can lead to pay disparities. But it's the burden of proof is on you, my friends, to explain those disparities. What do we do about this? You need to give this some attention. We see more and more of these equal pay coming, uh, challenges coming with the wage transparency laws I discussed earlier. It is going to be a thing that we're all gonna have to deal with in the future. And let's face it, we wanna pay people the same for substantially similar work. You're not going to have a great workplace if you're paying people for doing the same thing, if you're paying them different rates of pay. It's just not going to work out for you long term. And it's the right thing to do. We still have this 80 percent gender pay gap in the United States that's been there for 20, 30, 40 years. We need to be doing more as a society to pay people the same for substantially similar work. But when you're looking at this suggestion, Use a lawyer because when you discover that maybe you have a problem, you're going to want the privilege to be able to talk about that in an open manner and develop a compliance plan going forward. It's not as easy as just flipping a switch and saying, okay, well, now we're going to pay everybody the same for substantially similar work. A lot of thought needs to go into how that's accomplished and the communications program that goes along with that as well. All right, novel fringe benefits. We talked about novel pay. What about novel benefits? If you're thinking of coming up with a new benefit plans, five suggestions to follow. What are your goals? Who you're going to be talking to? What are the rules? And uh, being creative is a good idea, but pay attention to the details. Now, focusing on number three, I was introduced as a labor and employment lawyer, which is true but I am not an ERISA lawyer, an employment benefits lawyer. So this is going to be a high level surface, <laughs> you know, very high level discussion. And you would not want to call me and say, Bruce, are we following the rules with regard to our benefit program? Well, you could call me and I would introduce you to one of my partners. Uh, we have several of them here. We have a whole practice group that do just that, that do only look at employee benefits law. So goals, here are some common goals that people and organizations might have. Uh, who, who, are you trying to, who are you trying to affect here? What are the demographics? What motivates them? What are they going to be looking for? What are the rules? There are a lot of rules and they are complicated. You don't want to just roll something out and then call the lawyer. You want to call the employment's benefit lawyer as you're developing it. Be creative. Nothing wrong with that. Oh, we have two slides on that. Uh, what are some of the possibilities here? We've seen it all over the mark, all over the place. Fertility benefits. I, that's different kind of eggs. Sorry, that's not exactly a polite joke than the, uh, the eggs I was referring to either. Here's a big one. Dependent and child care benefits. Financial assistance, we've seen this publicized, will help you get your college education if you come to our entry level position here. Grandparent care, pet insurance, we have it at Littler. You can sign up for it and we'll give you veterinary insurance to cover your pets. But the details, my friends, you need to really think about these carefully and as I said, twice, and this is the third time, call the employment benefits lawyer as you're developing a creative new benefit program. All right, so that brings us to just about the top of the hour. I'll turn it back now to Kimball to bring us home. Wonderful. Thank you, Bruce. A really enlightening conversation. I wanted to just throw one last opportunity. I promised it earlier. Uh, if anyone's interested in Seeing a demo of any of the applications we mentioned today, we're, we're happy to set that up. Just select yes on the poll, and we'll reach out to you and get something scheduled. Um, beyond that, uh, a number of great questions. We will troll through those, and if there's any that we think have particular uh, common interest, we'll, we'll push something out in the follow-up. Um, other than that, uh, one last chance for any questions. Um, feel free to submit those in the Q&A poll here. And um, we'll give this a second just to see if there's anything else that we could address before we sign off. 
No, I'm seeing uh, just compliments on the presentation. So well done, Bruce. Thank you so much, as always. Appreciate your, your partnership and sharing your expertise. And with that, we will uh, sign the day back to all of you to get on with your, your day jobs. Thank you so much.